Let me quickly recap what we discussed uh, last week. So I think most of us were there last week and uh, we had error sharing with us on the topic of uh, humility and truth, where he said that it is the answer to loneliness. So he shared this Bible verse in under humility, uh, Luke 14, 11, where it says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then in truth, he shared this Bible quote on John 8, 32, uh, where he said that the truth will set us free. So basically what Errol shared was how humility and truth, in living humility and truth, we will be able to um, see Jesus so that uh, these two very special virtues will be the truth, will be the uh, deliverance for us from our loneliness. He also said how um, in John 7, 38, which says, whoever believes in me, rivers of living waters will flow from him where I said that it's not our will, but the will of the Lord. And as long as we are humble enough in front of the cross to accept this will and to accept this truth in our hearts, uh, we are able to conquer the world. So we are called to live in truth and humility in the world. So let me ask you a question. Has Anyone told you that you look like your father? Hands up if you, if someone said that you look like your father. <laughs> okay, only few. <you. laughs> and has anyone told you that you look like your mother? Right. <laughs> so, uh, but has anyone told you that you look like Jesus? <laughs> was it a no or was it a, a hand raise? <laughs> okay. Right. So, but today I'm going to speak to you about someone who lived these special virtues of humility and truth and where she is renowned for people, for most of us as the Apostle of Mercy or the Secretary of Divine Mercy because to that much she reflected the mercy of Jesus. So that's none other than as Shimaliaki said, Sen Faustina. So her name initially was Helena Kowalski. I hope I'm uh, <laughs> uh, repeating the name correctly. So uh, she is a Polish nun. Uh, so she was born somewhere in 1905 and she died in 1938. So during the time that she lived was actually the outburst of the World War I as well. And when, when, she, when she was, uh, while she was there, actually Poland was not even in the map because uh, it was separated and um, Poland was not even considered, nobody knew about Poland. And she's actually the third out of 10 children in the family. And the, they, have, they lived in a very far away village in Poland. And their family is very poor, and, but they were very religious. All the children were brought up in a very religious background. So uh, St. Faust, you know, Helena had a longing towards Jesus. Since she was a child, she had this desire it says that when she received the Holy Communion, she felt his presence itself. And so she longed to be um, with Jesus. She thought that being a nun would help her to come closer to God. She writes in her very famous diary where she said, I sense that I have a heart so big 
that nothing will be capable of filling it. So I turn with all the longing of my soul to God. This is what she had written down those days. But when she asked her parents as to whether she can join the convent, her parents denied her request because she was um, because of the financial crisis in the family she could not educate herself she only learned for three years and by like 15 or 16 she was working as a housemaid or as a nanny and she was doing all the odd jobs to support her family so being the obedient child she is she actually listened to her parents and she uh, she did she went ahead with her work, she be, uh, being a housemaid and all. Then again, the next year, by the age of 16, again, she asks her parents as to whether she can be a nun, but uh, they again um, do not grant her wish. Then uh, around 19 years old, uh, she, her sister, St. Faustina is not much of a party girl, but her sister asked her to come with her to a dance at a, um, at, uh, in the city. Uh, a public dance so this is like the first time she's also dancing with the boy as said so during this event this very ordinary event she suddenly saw a vision of Jesus suffering uh, she was so much shaken by this vision that she immediately ran to the nearest cathedral and there she started praying and believe me Till now, she has not seen Jesus. She has not heard the voice of Jesus as per how we know that she has had. Uh, so till now, she was only having this desire towards Jesus. But while she was in this cathedral, she heard the voice of Jesus very distinctively. And Jesus was asking her, why are you not coming to me? Like she, Jesus was saying as to why are you denying me? Uh, I want you to go to Warsaw, which is like the capital of Poland, and to join a convent in Warsaw. So this is all what Jesus said. He gave her a mission and to go to Warsaw and to join the convent. So immediately knowing this uh, call, she packed her bag and she went to this uh, capital city, which she has not been before. She was from a very uh, rural village, but she went alone and imagine her courage to go there alone. And when she went there, she knocked on most of the convent doors. Uh, however, almost all the convents rejected her because she did not have an education because uh, those days, in order to be someone very religious, you have to have a really good education. So she didn't have that. Also, she didn't have money to finance um, uh, her stay. So most of the convents rejected her. And this is, believe me now, this is a calling that Jesus gave her to do, a mission that Jesus asked her to do. And if I was her, at the very first time someone rejected me, I would have gone back to the village I came from. But she had so much courage and she believed in Jesus so much that she kept on uh, going all, on, uh, knocking all the doses of, uh, all the doors of uh, convents. Then one convent gave her hope. It's the congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. So what they said was that she should, however, have money to um, finance her habit. Then only she can join the convent. So then what she did was she went back. She again did some odd jobs and she earned money for one year. And then she came to this convent. Uh, when she was 20 years old and she joined the convent. Even when she joined the convent, uh, so she received the name Faustina, which means happy in a language. So the first few months when she joined the convent, now this is a vocation that Jesus asked her to do. When she joined the convent, uh, it was very hard for her. Uh, she had to get adjusted to the convent life. And she herself battled with thoughts, thinking that God did not love her or that he has rejected her because she felt so random because uh, all the other sisters were also not very kind to herself. She had to do jobs like cleaning, uh, cooking. 
uh, one sister told uh, one of the memoirs about her she said that sister faustina would spend every night alone in the kitchen cooking for 20 people that's and she, and she's tired but she kept on doing her work so these are the jobs that she was assigned to the task that she was assigned to in her convent and and even though jesus she heard the voice of jesus during this time she um, did not uh, hear his voice distinctively as she heard before and she was battling with herself as well she had written a lot about uh, that in her diary as well so this period uh, where some people may call as the uh, the dark night of the soul or the dark night of the spirit is like a tremendous test that god let many saints go through including us which we are called a sainthood and this time is a time where she believed is like a furnace for her soul where she thinks uh, she knows that she has received a lot of graces because um, she writes this in her diary where she i quote her i know very well what i am of myself the knowledge of my misery allows me at the same time to know the immense love of god's mercy so such a confession shows like how much she felt abandoned by god how lonely she felt and yet she kept on believing in god she kept on trusting in god um these uh, the things that she write in a diary they change time after time during this period and there comes a time where we ourselves can see uh, going through a diary that she had come to such a place where uh, nothing can you know take away uh, the love and trust that she has for god so um most of her confession that she wrote during this time at the latter part of it shows that how ready she was for her mission and in humility the awareness of god and of herself where she believed that this nothing that she is capable of the awareness of her nothingness allowed her to focus more on god and to be united in god's mercy and with such a state of mind and heart living in such a freedom knowing the truth of jesus she was ready to be sent to the whole world with god's message now the task that she did was very ordinary she was a cook she would work in the kitchen she would work in the bakery or in the garden there are some ordinary tasks that she did activities which actually also allowed her to feel and to dwell in the mystical experiences we read in the latter part of her life so at the age of 26 we uh, get to hear about how she received her vision about jesus which was in february 22nd in 1931 she saw jesus like we see him today in the divine mercy picture so you know this picture was the first picture that jesus himself uh, commissioned someone to draw of himself and he asked to write these three words i trust in you at the bottom of it so the way he saw the way she saw jesus was that he was wearing a white robe in the darkness and two rays love um, rays a uh, 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 red and white rays were flowing through him so jesus told to faustina regarding this uh, veneration of the image where he said in his own words i promise that the soul who venerate this image will not perish i also promise victory over the enemies already here on earth especially at the hour of death i myself will defend it as my own glory so um this image was very powerful the words were very powerful but however she was not able to execute the mission that she was asked to do to paint the picture because when she told about this vision to her nuns to her uh, she had a priest so when she told to all of these superiors none of them actually believed her 
she herself actually tried to get out of this mission, tried to excuse uh, saying like she can't do this, just like how many prophets uh, try to go beyond their mission. But actually God did not change his mind because he knows the people he chooses. And after two and a half years, um, a priest uh, who is also now a blessed uh, took the risk of helping her and he introduced her to a painter and still like it took so much of time to draw this image exactly the way that she saw and uh, it says that um, uh, in a new movie where it says that they have found like one day um, a group of people were praying with the shroud of Turin and then one day the, one of the ladies uh, took this, uh, like the original image they had of the Shroud of Turin, they, she took it and suddenly a sun ray came through it and it reflected on the Divine Mercy picture, but which was like behind that Shroud of Turin. So uh, at that time, they saw the both the images, the, the face of Jesus in the Shroud of Turin and the face in the Divine Mercy picture. They were exactly the same. The features, the shape of the face, everything was exactly the same and they were uh, the, the so the movie is exactly based on that it's known as uh, love and mercy i think yeah it came in 2019 so it basically reflects how uh, how um, truthful this image is so uh, while she was trying to uh, get this message that she, uh, jesus to um, to venerate this image in the meantime, her revelations also continued and Jesus gave her a lot of promises. He even requested her to make an act of sacrificing herself to the sinners. And by the age of 29, she made a significant change in her prayers as well. And soon after she dedicated herself to all the sufferings of the sinners, uh, she encountered a, uh, she, her health started declining. And she died at the significant age of 33. So most of the promises that Jesus gave that was written in a diary actually did not come true when she was alive. But however, they are coming true even up to now. So the promises given to her was not, not mortal promises, but immortal promises, which she's supposed to carry out now. So if you, if you are to see St. Faustina or to meet her, um, her, her characteristics uh, won't let you pay much attention to her, to be honest, uh, because she's like five feet, uh, three inches tall. Um, they say that before she became a nun, she had a very uh, thick blonde hair. It seems probably the blonde hair would have, you know, taken your attention, but other than that, She's just an ordinary girl. If you see her with a group of people, you wouldn't even notice her. Uh, she had freckles and all, just an ordinary face, an ordinary smile. But boy, did she grab the attention of Jesus. And, and um, she loved God so much. She even says... Um, she wanted to love God more than all the other people who loved him. And she was bold in the relationship she had with Jesus. And her life goal is very clear. And that was to be united to God. She writes this where she says, I have directed my flight at the very center of the sun's heat. And nothing can lower its course. So, um... All these things regarding St. Faustina seem so mystical, so um, uh, something that would never happen to us. But she was a very ordinary um, sister. I'll just read some of her um, uh, scripts uh, taken from her uh, diary where she shows how human she is. So this is one of my favorites. So she writes this, she says, Today, I was visited by a lay person, a person who has caused a lot of sorrow and who has abused my goodness, telling many lies. The moment I saw her, blood froze in my veins. And that gets me <laughs> how human she is. Because 
there stood before my eyes all that I had to suffer because of her. And the thought came to me to tell her the truth firmly, immediately, but at the same moment, mercy of God came before my eyes and I resolved to act toward her as Jesus would have acted in my place. So I started to talk to her gently and when she expressed her wish to talk to me alone, I, in a very delicate manner, made known to her clearly the sad condition of her soul. I saw that she was deeply moved, though she was trying to hide it from me. And then I heard the words of Jesus. I am glad you behaved as my true daughter. Be always merciful as I am merciful. Love everyone out of love for me, even your greatest enemies, so that my mercy may truly reflect in your heart. She was able to be the reflection of Jesus because she was humble before Jesus, before the cross. She endured all her sufferings because she loved Jesus. And that's the truth, my friends. Um, humility and truth will lead us to Jesus. Uh, let me reflect on a memo of a sister to tell how humble Sister Faustina is. So this is Sister Samuela writing in her memo. So have you all seen a wooden floor, like an old wooden floor? Have, maybe like, so in churches, some churches they have, right? So um, these wooden floors are very um, uneven. They are not smooth. They sometimes have uh, spaces in between um, and they have even spaces inside them as well. So they are not very uneven. So this is the uh, task that she was supposed to do. So this sister was saying, it was one sister Faustina's responsibility to clean that wooden floor. And she stands many hours on her knees, scrubbing the floor with a brush, a hand made by sister Faustina. And that was a rainy day. Uh, one of the sisters came from town wearing muddy train boots rain boots. She was um, angry with Sister Faustina for some reason and with a temper she entered the convent and walked right over the newly scrubbed floor. She didn't stop to remove her shoes until she reached the end of the floor. Sister Faustina being there seeing this she said nothing. She bent down, picked up one boot and gave to Sister Samuela, who's writing this memo. And Sister Faustina took the other boot and cleaned. So Sister Samuela, being a novice at that time, asked, why are you doing such a thing for such an annoying sister? Then Sister Faustina said, for the love of Jesus. So love is patient, is kind, it is not arrogant or rude. Uh, it is not irritable or resentful. Love endures all things. Love bears all things. So when we speak of loneliness, we do not want to be lonely. We tend to uh, immerse ourselves with other people and we do not uh, tend to immerse ourselves in Jesus rather. But do you know that Jesus himself is also feeling lonely? Because he says to Sister Faustina, my heart dreams only of the ingratitude and forgetfulness of souls living in the world. They have time for everything, but they have no time to come to me. So to understand our loneliness, to understand our imperfections, who else are we to look other than this perfect superhuman being that we have, which is Jesus? And that's exactly what Sister Faustina did. She looked into him, she believed in him, and she humbled in front of him. By looking to him, we are able to realize that who we are, we are able to understand our imperfections and how to overcome these imperfections. And we even are able to understand our loneliness through the experience 
that he himself had. So Sister Faustina is reminding that uh, Jesus too has a heart. He too has feelings and he loves us so much. And Sister Faustina says that Jesus focuses on her heartbeat so much that he knows when her heart is beating for him. And with that said, let me wind up um, the story of Faustina with a small prayer that um, she made. She had that written a lot of prayers actually, but this prayer is so beautiful. She prays for um, to, to be like Jesus. Um, she in this prayer, she this is a long prayer, but I'll just uh, get only the extracts of this. She prays for merciful eyes. Uh, so that uh, she will be able to get out of the judgmental attitude and to love and to see the beauty of others. She pray for merciful ears so that it will help to listen to what others are going through. She pray for a merciful tongue. She says, help me, my Lord, that my tongue may be merciful, that I may never speak negatively of my neighbor, but have a word of comfort and forgiveness for all. She pray for merciful feet. She says, help me, O Lord, that my feet may be merciful, that I may hurry to my neighbor, overcoming my own fatigue and weariness, and to, rest, uh, and to find my rest in serving others. She prays for merciful hands. Help me, O Lord, that my hands may be merciful will be filled with the good deeds uh, to take upon more difficult tasks. And she prays for a merciful heart. Help me, O Lord, with a merciful heart so that I myself may feel all sufferings from my neighbors. I will refuse my heart to no one. I will hear, um, I will... Uh, I, I will uh, be there for who I know, even who abuses my kindness. So this is how we will also be if we um, um, allow the truth to be reflected in our hearts as well. She was just a broken vessel and God reflected his mercy through her. And that's what we are also called. And... Um, I myself am not the best person to talk about humility or truth. Even when Errol was speaking about humility and truth, my mom was nudging me. He's talking all about you, <laughs> you know. And, and Sister Faustina and all the saints that are before us actually helps us and guide us. And Sister, one of the favorite quotes of St. Faustina is where she says that if angels are to envy us, uh, they would envy us, one, for the Holy Eucharistic, um, and then second, for our sufferings, because through our sufferings, uh, not that we get to meet Jesus, but Jesus get to meet us. And there's no other God who wants to be so close to us. Uh, and, and let us also follow the same path. Praise the Lord. <laughs>